Welcome to the project subcommittee meeting. We're going to go ahead and get started. As I said, good morning, everybody. Um, we're not too terribly late. It's only 10 15. So. Uh, I'm here to present the Bryce House, which is located in the city of Minneapolis. Um, so here's Anne Arundel County, where we currently are located. Annapolis is approximately here. And if we zoom in a little bit further, Bryce House is located here. So this is the Naval Academy. Um, this is the building. There's the stadium, if you know Annapolis at all. If you don't, that's OK. Just know that it's a little bit away from the water and kind of in the city. <laughs> um, as you can see, the Bryce House is located right where my pointer is. So it is within the um, intensely developed area of the critical area, which is designated in red. And then the purple is, again, the Naval Academy, at least the section that's within the critical area. Here we go again. Bryce House, um, if any of you were here a few years ago, we also did a presentation on the William Paca House, which is pretty much adjacent to the Bryce House. Um, but the Bryce House is a historic property, and its site is just under 0.4 acres. Right now you can see it. The house was built in the 1770s, so it's quite old. Um, and the purpose of the project is actually to do some renovations in the back to help with um, creating, I guess it's an underground vault for stormwater aspects. Um, and they'll be reconfiguring some of the backyard we'll see in the next couple of slides. So it will disturb approximately 13,900 square feet. Um, up but it will decrease the lot coverage by approximately 3,700 square feet. So we're losing a lot of lot coverage, which is a boon in the city. Um, there will be 11 trees cleared in the back. Uh, one of the goals of this project is to revert the house to what it looked like when it was originally built. So they want to have the landscaping look more like it looked when it was originally planned um, and the existing trees don't really fit in. So they'll be removed, um, but there is mitigation provided for that. Um, they'll be provided. So we'll go to the next slide. You can see the impacts on the left. The green areas are the current areas that are vegetated um, and you can see sort of all of the I won't say random but sort of random pathways that are going through um, and then on the right the proposed we have slightly larger chunks of vegetated areas um, and some of the pathways are kind of smoothed out the project will also make the house um, ADA accessible so it fills a lot of requirements in one I mentioned those 11 trees had to be removed. So there will be 12 trees that are planted, um, proposed to plant three trees in the William Paca back garden, so pretty much adjacent to the project. Um, and then down just south, right, Bryce House is right here. This is just south, um, planting some crab apple trees at 18 Pinky Street, which is another property that's owned by Historic Annapolis. Um, and then three more trees, four more trees over here near the Annapolis Summer Garden Theater, not actually at the Summer Garden Theater. Um, and that's right off of Palmer Street. So other agency comments. Their stormwater management plan and sediment and erosion control plan was approved on April 13th of this year. 
uh, DNR did not find any different <coughs> under endangered species. Maryland Historical Trust, um, since the Bryce House is a National Historic Landmark and it's a Maryland National Registry property, um, MHT has been working closely on this project um, for the renovation plans and they have no concerns. In fact, they're I think, rather happy with it. Um, and there were no U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed endangered species refugees, refuges or fish hatcheries. Because it is a state project, we have to mention some closer resiliency. So again, Bryce House here in orange. This map shows um, sea level rise projections up to 10 feet of sea level rise. And you can see that the Bryce House is outside of the sea level rise area. It's approximately 600 feet in um, And then if we look at storm surge, the red line would be a category four projected storm surge. And again, Bryce House is located outside of those projected storm surges. Public notice was posted in Capital Gazette, as well as a sign posted at the physical property. Um, we have not received any comments. So staff recommends within 60 days of the date of commission approval, the final mitigation and planting plan shall be submitted to commission staff, and then within 60 days of commission approval, a signed planting agreement um, form for the mitigation shall be submitted to the commission staff for review. Okay. Thanks, Keith. And I think we had a representative from we the We do. Sorry, I forgot to mention David Alamante is here, and he's been working on it. All right. Thanks. All right, so this time, do any commissioners have questions about the project? Yeah, just a quick question. So the building a, a detention vault, water, stormwater detention vault? Yes. They are building a utility vault. Uh, they're, they're doing a dry well for uh, the stormwater. <laughs> and that's, uh, although the overall uh, the overall impervious is reduced on the property. Uh, they still have to do some stormwater to uh, meet the, uh, the criteria of the commission. And uh, because some of the areas were not, have some of the individual uh, areas requiring investigation didn't have any reduction, it got all it's compensating for that in the rear somewhat in, in a drive up, in two drive ups. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, since uh, this project is to demolish the existing brick walkways and walls, mm -hmm. how old are the existing ones? Are you, are you, are you going to tell me 1774? I don't believe so. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, the, but I assume that they are, don't date back to 1774 because the goal is to revert it to what it looked like historically. Mm -hmm. So the um, the prior owners or one of the intervening owners, the recent intervening owner, was the uh, Masons Association or something. Uh, it was a, a, a Masons Association, and they did uh, surprisingly. Poor brickwork. <laughs> All right. If there are no further questions, um, based on the staff report and staff recommendations, I uh, can get a motion on this project. I, I move to approve with said conditions. Thank you. Can I second? second. Thank you, Commissioner Grant. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thanks. All right, the second project that we're going to hear from, um, Kate is going to present this one with the Maryland Transportation Authority Amendment to the Nice Bridge Improvement Project Condition 2. Uh, Offsite mitigation, you might recur, um, recall, we had uh, heard about this project at a couple of previous commission meetings. It's me again. 
Um, I'm Kate Durant. This is the Nice Bridge Amendment to Condition Number Two request. Um, okay, I think. Amanda and Julie from MDTA are sitting behind me. Charlotte and they are here. If we have any additional questions, we hope there's no more. But um, this is the very nice new Nice Bridge. Um, it looks much safer than the previous nice Middleton Bridge. Just to give you an overview of what we're looking at. Um, sorry, I should say, in the background, you can see these are the old um, posts that were holding up the Boulder Bridge. They are still there, but they're in the process of working through removing them. Uh, to give you a little bit of a timeline, because I, many of you were not here for this whole process. Um, in August of 2018, the Nice Bridge Replacement Project was approved by the Commission with five conditions. In August 2019, um, it was brought back to the Commission so that they could vote on amendments to conditions number two and number five, which were approved. At that point, condition number two was updated to reflect the fact that they were struggling to find room on site to provide the required mitigation for the 10% pollution reduction. So condition number two at that point was amended to allow them to look off-site in the nearby watersheds. Um, it also requires that there be an update to the commission in the near future once they found something. So in March 2020, came back, there was an update because MDTA had located a project location that was in the same watershed. Um, it was a stream restoration project and they had were just sort of starting to work with the property owner to get um, approval to work on the land and do all of their necessary background information. And then the COVID pandemic kind of happened immediately after that meeting and everything kind of came to a grinding halt. Um, so MDTA continued to try to work with the property owner. They were still working with him. Um, it just became a much slower process than they originally anticipated. So October 12th of 2022, the nice bridge reopened, or I should say the new bridge opened. Um, and December 2022 was the proposed date for construction completion of the offsite stream restoration project, which was not met. Um, due to, again, those slowdowns and delays related to the pandemic. For, again, so you know, the 10% pollution reduction for the entire project was um, just under 29 pounds required. They were able to provide a little over nine pounds on site, um, and then that left a little over 19 pounds remaining. So when they started looking for offsite projects, they were looking at stream restoration projects as well as other types of projects. But this sort of fit in with some of the um, projects that MDE was even suggesting. So MDE had a requirement that they also needed some extra mitigation. We decided that 1,000. 100 linear feet of stream restoration is required to meet that offset of the 19 pounds. Um, and it'll provide ecological benefits as well as, um, I've seen the stream, it's it's a little degraded and kind of runs through an agricultural field, so it's not in the best shape. Um, but I think after this project, it will be. And then here's the offsite project location. The stream actually, it comes from here and from here, and then starts going this way. There's a culvert under the road, and then it continues down to the vegetated area. Um, all till it's around 2,000 linear feet, so they're actually providing more stream restoration than is actually required um, to meet their mitigation goals. And I believe the project has been sent to MDE and the Army Corps for review. So they should be getting their permits by the end of this year, at the latest, hopefully earlier. 
um, so they can start construction hopefully earlier. Um, <laughs> the, the company doing the construction believes it will take about six months, but there's always street closures and things like that that may make it go a little bit longer. So the current condition that was approved as an amendment in August of 2019 is listed here. It's also provided on page one of your staff report. Um, and basically it talks about how they can look for projects offsite, looking specifically in Charles and St. Mary's County in the Lower Potomac and Prince George's County in the Washington Metro Potomac. And then they shall provide an update to the full commission on the status by March 2020, which they did. And then complete construction of acceptable stormwater management offsets by December 2022, which they were not able to. So our proposed amendment keeps the language um, saying that the they can look for off-site mitigation projects. And then we are requesting basically to update the bottom paragraph saying the Maryland Transportation Authority shall provide a progress report, or, sorry, progress update to the full commission no later than March of 2024 if necessary and shall complete construction of accept acceptable stormwater management offsets by November 30th of 2024. We believe that that will provide them enough time to get through permitting and construction, even if there are some hiccups along the way. So staff recommends the commission approve the updates to the required deadlines for condition number two. And I'll go back to the proposed amendment so that you guys can read it more fully. But it is also provided on page three of your staff report. Thanks, Kate. Give a second for folks to read that. Um, does anyone have any questions about the proposed amendment and conditional approval extending the time frame? All right. Can I get a motion um, based on the staff report and the staff presentation on the conditional approval of this project? Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Palmer. Second. Second. Uh, Commissioner Glantz. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Right. The third project we'll hear um, about is the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission Jackson Landing Voting Access Facility Renovations. Uh, Michael Grassman will do that, and while they're getting that pulled up, do we have any representatives from that project here? Jason Turban, Baylor Consultants. Okay, thanks. to talk to you about a project uh, for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, who I will now refer to as MSCPPC, to save a little time for breath. Um, they're going to be doing a renovation at the Jackson Landing Road Access Facility. Um, as was introduced, Jason Trayvon from Bayland is here to answer any questions that I can not. So this project is located in Prince George's County, right along the Tuxen River at the Tuxen River Park, the Jump Bay Natural Resource Area. Beautiful place. If you haven't been there already, I strongly recommend you visit. This is mostly a water-dependent project, excluding the new ADA accessible parking spaces. Um, these are going to be impacts within the buffer that are not water dependent. So it has to be reviewed by the commission because MNCPPC is a quasi-state agency. The commission has to approve any of these projects based on Comar 270205. So um, again, mainly water dependent, um, but there are some non-water dependent access um, 
it is totally within the resource conservation area. Site area size is 21.55 acres. Limits of disturbance are 0.11. It's an ecologically sensitive area. We have a lot of habitat protection areas around and in the project site. All of them are listed up here. We have national heritage areas, waterfowl concentration areas. There's forest uh, interior dwelling bird habitat near the project location. Um, submerged aquatic vegetation in the water and wetlands of uh, special state concern. Uh, this is a very popular area. It experiences a high amount of use throughout the year. Um, the site is very constrained in terms of the uh, location and access. And current conditions actually make it kind of difficult for use and somewhat hazardous. Um, the degraded ramp and pier is inundated at high tide. Uh, there are broken pilings on some of the areas. It's old boards on the fishing pier. Um, it is a 25 year old facility. So it has reached the end of its design life. Most of the repairs are going to be in-kind replacements. Uh, fishing pier and pilings, floating pier and dock, the boat ramp and the blank walls are going to be entirely replaced, the kayak pier and launch area. Um, all of these are also going to be upgraded to be ADA accessible. Uh, one of the major changes is going to be that the gravel parking lot is going to be converted, uh, converted to asphalt. Uh, this will also allow for some more ADA access and parking. Um, so there's going to be about 479 square feet of additional lot coverage beyond the kind of placements. These are the existing conditions. Everything that's in red is what's going to be um, replaced. The blue is going to remain as is. Current existing lot coverage is about 3,559 square feet. These are the proposed conditions. Asphalt parking lot replacement, boat ramp, ADA ramp, ADA piers, ADA parking, um, fishing areas, kayak launch area here, the stairs and wood pier are going to remain. All but uh, 30 square feet of the LOD is within the buffer. Uh, there's no clearing proposed, uh, and the impacts are minimized for the buffer. A little more detail on impacts and mitigation. Water dependent impacts are 269 square feet. They will be mitigated at 2 to 1. Non water dependent impacts are 268 square feet. They will be mitigated at 3 to 1. The required mitigation total is uh, just for the impacts of the buffer, it's about 12,277 square feet. Um, that's a gross amount because they will be removing a little bit of lot coverage as part of this. Um, the total amount, which you see down here, 1,877 square feet because they're going to be incorporating some water quality pollution reduction plantings to meet the 10%, which is covered in this slide. Uh, conversion and the renovation is going to result in 0 0.03 pounds per phosphorus removal reduction rate annually, and they're going to comply with this with 600 square feet of plantings as part of the project. Here's the proposed mitigation plan. It's attached to your staff report. Um, a lot of pretty colors on here. Basically, um, the main thing to get from this is that they are going to be going above and beyond the planting requirement um, for both the disturbance to the buffer and the water quality plantings. I want to draw a little bit of attention to this area here where the red arrow is. We worked with MNC PPP staff and consultant on this area to address some concerns about shore erosion and stormwater runoff that were brought up about this project and was originally um, presented to the commission. So with uh, some site visits, we were able to come up with some really deeply rooted grasses and additional plantings in this area that are going to be able to capture some stormwater runoff. Um, it's also worth mentioning that this gravel parking lot, the slope is going to be reduced a little bit to hopefully um, cut back on the velocity of some of the stormwater runoff that may occur from here. Other state agency reviews, um, NDE uh, needed authorizations for tidal wetlands impact and Board of Public Works issued a wetlands license with some special conditions um, that had to be met as part of this construction. Because the impacts don't exceed 5,000 square feet, no stormwater management or sediment and roach control is needed. However, as I just mentioned, we did work with MNC PPC and the consultant to address stormwater management concerns and some erosion concerns. MHT determined there are no impacts on historical or archaeological resources. 
there was a little more review in terms of some of the sensitive habitat uh, that is around and in the project area. And it was determined there are no impacts to rare threats or endangered species in the habitat, um, no impacts to waterfowl concentration areas. Uh, there's no clearing, so there's not going to be any impacts on the FIDS. Uh, in kind replacement and best managed practices are listed in the BBW license that will help minimize impacts to SAB, um, fish propagation waters, as well as uh, wetlands and special state concerns. Uh, they're going to be doing this by upland construction. A lot of the work is going to be taking place out of the water and then going to be brought down and uh, put in place. They're also going to be putting up a coffer dam so that none of the runoff or anything that's going to happen will impact the propagation waters or submerged aquatic vegetation. And they will also have time of year restrictions because it's a water valve concentration area. So NBC will adhere to all of the recommendations in the BBW license. Coastal resilience findings. Um, the site area is vulnerable to uh, sea level rise two feet above. It will also begin to experience inundation at a category two storm surge, which persists as you go to category three and four. At the edge of a wetland migration area. And the entire project is also within the Coast Smart uh, Coastal Ready Action Boundary, that boundary. Um, they have, MSC PBC has requested exemption from some of the requirements per Coast Smart because this is a water dependent project. They're going to implement best management practices to the best of their ability by putting floating structures in place and raising them to be above mean high water where possible. Public notice was posted July 2nd through 16th, 2020. I know that was a while ago. This project has been in the works for a long time. Um, no comments were received, and signs were posted on site uh, to remain on site. Uh, questions? Um, so, just a quick question regarding it says that the no stormwater management was required because there was less than 5,000 square feet of uh, earth disturbance, but the parking lot, um, so there's no grading associated with the parking lot? There is some minor grading, uh, basically just to reduce the slope across. Um, and it's more of a turnaround uh, launch area as opposed to the actual parking lot. The, the existing parking that's kind of around the corner from where the launch is is remaining ground. But then there is some very minor grading to reduce the slope. It's approximately 9.5% now, and it's being reduced to about 8% slope. So then was that area calculated in like the 5,000, like less than 5,000 square yes. feet? Was that, so that was calculated into the um, earth disturbance? Okay. Actually, any other questions? Okay, that being said, staff recommendation is that uh, improve the project as well. Also, I want to take a minute to uh, give a shout out to Kate Harris. She really was the one who did most of the work on this project. Um, she brought it to the finish line. I just had to kind of punch it through to the end zone, so I really thank Tay. She worked with consultants, she put together a lot of the report and uh, this presentation. So. She deserves the accolades. Oh, well, thank you. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the chiefs and Kate uh, for switching her jurisdictions. <laughs> it keeps us on our toes. <laughs> All right. Without any further questions, um, somebody interested in making a motion uh, based on staff recommendation and staff report? Uh, I'll make a motion to second. Thank you, Commissioner Eads. Uh, second. Second. Thanks. Tammy. So we'll move to um, the fourth project. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> um, any opposed? Any abstentions? Thanks. All right, so the fourth project um, is one from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, and Tay will be doing that presentation. I just have to open it.
All right, I'm seeing yours. I'm a natural resources planner, obviously, at the Code Clear Commission. I'm going to present to you today the University of Maryland's Center for Environmental Services, also known as OMSIS, their Chesapeake Collaborative, or Chesapeake Analytics Collaborative Building Proposal. Before I get into the specifics of the proposal, I'd like to introduce a few members of the project team that are here today. So we have Aaron Peel, he's with Environ Projects. He was the project manager, kind of keeping everything uh, organized on their end. Then we have Dave Fazio. He's with Oxy's most of you probably know him, but sit in this room today. And then we also have Dawson Bloom. He is the vice president um, for civil with McLaren Engineering. Well, so if you all have any questions that I can't answer, someone over there should be. <laughs> So the project is located in Calvert County on Solomon's Island. OMSIS can trace its origins back to the Chesapeake Biological Lab established in 1925. So if this project is approved today, this project will contribute to a long-standing history of OMSIS conducting scientific analysis to inform environmental policy to improve conditions in the Bay Watch. So we are bringing this project to you today as well under KOMAR 270205 because this is a state agency sponsored project located on state agency owned lands. This project is also being brought to you today under KOMAR 270206, which is conditional approval. This project requires conditional approval because the lot coverage proposed on the RCA designated portion of the LOD <coughs> exceeds the 15% lot cover split. So before I get into all that, I'm going to start with the basics. Here we have the LOD outlined in black that is comprised of 0.9 acres. And of that LOD, we have 0.72 acres located on lands designated LDA. And that is this, these lands here outside of this red box. Red box comprises um, land designated conservation resource conservation area, and that comprises 0.18 acres. All right. So the existing impervious surface in the IDA portion of the LOD is 1,626 square feet, and the existing lot coverage in the RCA designated portion of the LOD comprises 6,752 square feet, and that's 40% um, lot coverage on the RCA lot, and that's why we have conditional approval, but I'll get into that later um, in the presentation. So on site, there are approximately 22 native trees and bushes, there are landscaping plantings, and then the buffer here is designated modified buffer area. So modified buffer area, <coughs> provisions allow for flexibility for impacts to the buffer. It's different than the 100 foot buffer. Um, although it still is 100 feet from mean high water, it allows for um, impacts generally outside of the 25, set, 25 foot setback from mean high water. Mitigation is required at 2 to 1 and no variance is required. But under the 100 foot buffer, it's generally pro it's Provisions generally prohibit impacts to the 100 foot buffer. A variance is required if there are impacts, and mitigation is 3 to 1. So here, um, UMSI's, in the IDA, we have the, um, we have a trail that transgresses across the LOD. We have a two story framed house, and we have an associated garage, that's on the RCA, and then also on the RCA we have a parking garage. Um, and so, um, overall in the IDA, there's 1,156 square feet, the proposed clearing in the IDA is 3,659 square feet, and it's mostly along here, the trees along here, and here. And then up, um, that there's 450 square feet buffer being cleared, and then RC, uh, black garbage on the RCA to be removed is the parking lot, part of the trail. 
So that comprises 4,075 square feet. And there's no clearing proposed on the RC. Okay, so the proposed activities. Here we have a parking lot, a sidewalk, another sidewalk, a little sidewalk here. And here we have the building, it's depicted in brown. And then down here we have um, impacts to the modified buffer areas, 85 square feet. They're made um, by a grass whale that is tied into an outfall that drains directly into the bay. And under our stormwater management guidelines, we allow for such impacts in a modified buffer area. And then the RCA, whoops. So the total proposed gross, I'm sorry. Did I move forward in the slides? No? No. Okay. So the, the total proposed gross impervious surface is 12,119 square feet. And the permanent disturbance in the IDA altogether is 0.3 acres. And the total proposed gross lot coverage in the resource conservation area portion of the LOD is 7,636 square feet. And that comprises 25% of the the permanent disturbance of RCA totals 0.2 acres. So mitigation in the modified uh, buffer area for the intensely developed area only is required at a rate of two to one for the permanent disturbance caused by the grass soil and for the clearing of 450 square feet. Outside the buffer management area, mitigation is required at a rate of one to one for the 3,209 square feet clearing. So in total, there's 4,279 square feet of required mitigation on the IDA designated portion of the LOD. Um, so UMSEAS is proposing 4,800 square feet of two-inch caliper tree uh, plantings, uh, 24 of those, and I think that's the pillar white surface berry, magnolia, sweet magnolia tree, and red beetles. So that exceeds the mitigation requirement by 521 square feet. That 521 square feet is going to be used towards offsetting the lot coverage overage on the RCA personal. I will discuss that later on in the presentation. Okay, so there's a 0.72 pounds per year of phosphorus that needs to be reduced based on the proposal. And OSCE's proposes two micro fire retentions here and then a, a fire retention here. And that produces a 1.05 pound uh, annual reduction in phosphorus, which exceeds the requirement by 0.33 pounds of phosphorus. Other agencies re uh, reviews required are DMR wildlife heritage service, which on August 8th, 2022, they determined that there were no impacts to rare, dangerous, and threatened species or species in need of conversation. 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 Thank you. I'm being very dry in the mouth for sure. All right, so the MHP's determination was made on September 7, 2022. No impacts to archaeological resources or historical resources on site. And then on May 8, 2023, um, MDE approved the stormwater management plan and the erosion of sediment control plan. So under COMAR 22, COMAR 27, 02, 05, and 03, state agencies need to address coastal resiliency for proposing impacts on state um, As you can see, the map on the left is the sea level rise. The Site is right here, so it is outside of any uh, sea level rise in the regional vulnerability area uh, places. And then, although not shown on this slide, it's also the project site is also located outside of the CS graph. It's located outside of the 100 year flood. It does not experience nuisance flooding, but it is located adjacent to the VE zone. And that is a FEMA zone that is indicative for wave action. Um, you can also see here it's outside of uh, wetland migration areas, the LED, but it does have potential impacts for Category 3 storm surge. 
So what MCS has done to address these issues is they are elevating their first floor, the first floor of their building, to 3.75 feet above flood waters. They, um, see, they are planting, if I'm going to restart to fail, fail me. They're planting, um, I think, over 11,000 square feet of meadow in the areas adjacent to the BE zones. Um, they also reduced the number of pavers on the RCA portion of the property by <coughs> 10 square feet so that they could save a 50 inch DH tree. I think I covered it. Okay, for that part. And then because they're outside of the CS crab, but they're surrounded, they are surrounded by it. Um, they were required, so they met the category of categorical exemption, but they were required to uh, create a hazard mitigation plan in case they have, yeah, they get inundated by a category to resource. Okay, so public notice uh, was posted in the Southern Room of Times on October 14th of 2022 and November 4th of 2022. And then on-site postings occurred on 11, November 11th, 2022, and down in the right-hand corner, we'll start to pick for the signs placed on-site. Okay, so now we get to the conditional approval part of the PowerPoint. <coughs> for um, a project to be written to qualify for conditional approval, Approval. The commission, um, I mean, the state or local agency must demonstrate that the proposal meets the following features. So the first one is a sort of special feature or circumstance on site that would prevent the proposal from occurring if critical area regulations are strictly enforced. So I don't know if you remember, but on the beginning slides, it showed the patchwork of RCA and IDA designated. Plants. And so over the years, I remember 1925 is when Biological Lab was established, but since then, Umpsy's campus was, has become underdeveloped and they've bought the residential properties that were originally there. And so some properties have been upzoned to IDA, but others still have not. So that's why you have the patchwork. Um, the second, I think, the second. Um, criteria for consideration is the proposal otherwise provides a substantial public benefit to the critical area program, and that's a basic commitment. They do environmental studies, informs policy, program development for Chesapeake Bay. And then the third consideration is the proposals in conformance with the applicable critical area law and regulations. So this proposal is in conformance with all critical area law and regulations except for the the black coverage on the RCA. And as I discussed, oh, well, so let me discuss this next. So what they're doing to offset the RCA lot coverage overage is uh, they, they removed the 1,000 square feet from the original uh, permeable per per sidewalk. Um, let's see, they're planting the meadows next to the VE zones. And there's one other thing. Let's see. Additional planting. What is it? There was like additional planting from the mitigation that was coming oh, yes. towards the And then, as Charlotte just said, 521 square feet of additional planting from uh, mitigation discussed previously. Okay, so at a minimum, the conditional for request shall contain the following. It's demonstration that the literal enforcement of a subtitle would prevent uh, an authorized state or local program or project from occurring. So again, the patchwork of the designations, uh, if the RCA regulations for the lot coverage were enforced, then RCs could not realize, you know, or maximize the potential on it. Um, means by which the project conforms to locally approved uh, critical area program. I basically touched on that on the last slide. So, um, Again, it's the 521 square feet of additional plantings. It's the uh, meadow plantings adjacent to the BE zone. And it's the removal of 110 square feet of permeable pavers that were originally proposed. And then um, we have to demonstrate the measures proposed to mitigate the adverse effects of the project. I think I clearly demonstrated all that by now. 
So, um, and then here we have the commission shall approve deny request modifications to request to the request for the conditional approval based on these factors. So you all need to consider these things. Uh, the extent to which the proposal complies with the relevant chapters of the sub subtitle. The adequacy of the proposed required mitigation measures that cannot be met on site does not apply to this project. And the extent to which the proposal, including any mitigation measures, provides substantial benefits to the overall program. Do you have anything else? Central My staff with this time recommendation is please approve this project after OMSI submits their executed planting agreement within 90 days. Great job, Tay. That was that was a big one. I need to drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, does anybody have any questions um, for Tay or Project Team? I, I do. I do. So there was mention of an outfall structure that will discharge to the Chesapeake Bay, and I guess I just want to make sure that is this an existing? Is there an already an existing outfall structure that's there that we're not adding a new out outfall structure? Yeah, it's existing. That was my understanding. Correct. Okay, no, perfect. So I just wanted to make sure because that would be like an additional license that would be required from tidal wetlands. Any new discharges that are within a thousand feet um, requires a, a tidal wetlands license. So I just wanted to make sure that there's already an existing that you're just kind of adding on to it and that it's not a new outfall structure. So perfect. Other questions? I guess I have more of a, uh, I, do, I do have a question somewhere what I'm going to say, but um, as, as a Calvert County, and I just want to say that this is a project that we're very proud of and, and you know, excited about. And, and while it, 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 it provides substantial public benefit, not only to us, but, you know, the, the state of Maryland. And, and uh, my question is coming. And uh, um, it is good to, to read that, with, that, that we are exceeding the, uh, the critical area of phosphorus reduction by more than 30 percent. Um, but my question is, um, we're not real keen on uh, long acronyms in Coward County, so would you tell me again what we call it? U UMCS? Oh, okay, so University of Maryland. What, I mean, how do you say the acronym? UMCS. UMCS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this is how you can remember it, all right? UMCS, UMCS. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, we, we still we still say Culver County, you Calvert County. So I don't know. We're going to have to work on this acronym, but I do want to say that it's a great project, and I fully support it. So, you thank know. you for your comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. <laughs> I'm also curious. Where did you get the first slide? It looks like it's like neon green, like some kind of algae bloom going along. The, the first slide. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was just Keep interesting. More. That one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> DNR. <laughs> Ariel uh, Merlin. Yeah, just the color. Um, it could be weird, but yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it could just be the trick of the lighting. Yes, yes, but definitely it is, gets it is your very attention. Shallow. That island, it's, it's the, the water line around the island is very shallow. I wouldn't doubt that that's probably taken during the summer, and that's probably algae on sediment. That the water that's being so, seen may, from here. so it actually may be an algae bloom of some kind. So yeah, but, but I also think it's it's not on the surface algae bloom, but it's a sediment algae bloom. Okay. Yeah. Well, we need a presentation on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next, next week. A serious <laughs> Yeah, I just have one comment. I think this was um, really helpful to walk through, especially all of the um, resilience factors, too. Um, I think it was great to kind of work through from the Coast Guard Council's perspective that CS Crab and the sea level rise and kind of what we did to address that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, too. Um, so with that, um, would we be have able to have a commissioner make a motion uh, based on the staff report and staff recommendation? I move to approve with said conditions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mahoney? Second the approval. Um, all right, let's take a vote. All those in um, approval? Aye. Uh, Aye. Um, opposed? Abstentions? All right, thank you so much. Okay, you're off the hook for a little bit here. You <laughs> get your drink of water. All right, the next uh, project. Yeah, so Susan is still presenting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think Nick's going to. You said you think that was complicated and long, but you all better put your seatbelts on. Yeah, for this afternoon. You better get Susan some water and everything. <laughs> 
think she's gonna need something stronger than water. I'll put some mint in it. I'm gonna say four shots of something stronger than water. They're not even to commission a question yet. Okay. Start my number. All right, so it's uh, Nick. Okay, so just bear in mind, this is Susan's presentation, so to me, this is like me driving a car I don't know. So I'm not sure exactly what's going to come up here. I know sort of what the functions are, but there are no emergency controls, so please bear with me as I follow along with this. Um, so the project is this Baltimore County Irrigation Park and Spare Point Park. It covers UNS leaders here in Baltimore County, and there's other staff here in the county. You can just stand up and give me an We're just bachelor. Okay. So we have staff here, so in case there's anything that I don't know, it will hopefully bill in the void for me. Um, this is a project that requires conditional approval because there will be buffer disturbance for the projects. Part of the site required voluntary ground fills cleanup, um, so that's the reason there's disturbance of buffer just the grading there. Um, so basically, we would kind of go for a quick project overview, we'll talk about the impacts and the mitigation that's required. Um, mentioned public notice, we'll go through the conditional approval process, and then I'll open it up for any questions. Um, so, once again, they want to construct a new park with community building, multi purpose field, playground, a very high up platform, um, and a new store and management for associated facilities. It's a 22 acre site, it's located on a critical area of lands designated by the day. Um, so this is an area that does not have a lot of public recreation, which is why it's so important. Um, you know where Trade Point Atlantic is, Sparrows Point is in that area. Um, so this is a really needed part of the community, which is why the county's here today to bring the project forward. It's going to have a 16,000 square foot community center, double court gym, two community accessible activity rooms, concessions area, synthetic turf field, 10,000 square foot playground, and immediate accessible fishing for your kayak launch and walking path. It sounds really cool. Uh, project was again, it's just located in Baltimore County, it's again, it's Trade Point Atlantic, it's, um, sort of that's the area where it's at. This is going to be um, part of the site of the project location itself, which is why there's associated uh, clearing that is discussed in the staff report. This is a, kind of a quick idea of site plans. You can kind of see that a lot of the actual construction itself is trying to stay outside of those cleared areas, I mean, out of those forested areas, but there is still associated clearing. As I mentioned previously, there is um, those brownfields being a voluntary cleanup here, so that's done. So that's part of the reason why we're getting into disturbance here, to sort of deal with some of the capping. Total impacts for the projects within the buffer um, for permanent disturbance, they are providing three to one mitigation. Um, it's only 4,036 square feet of permanent disturbance, that's less than um, one tenth of an acre. For riparian access for that fishing pier, we're talking about two to one mitigation, so almost a um, thousand square feet of plantings for that. And then for temporary disturbance, temporary disturbance does not necessarily require mitigation, but the county's offering one to one mitigation for that, so 2.41 acres. So in all, we're getting a total amount of buffer mitigation of 2.81 acres for this project. Inside the buffer, they are doing forest clearing of 2.99 acres, and if I'm not mistaken, they are providing one to one mitigation for that as well. Uh, in terms of tidal wetlands, for tidal wetlands impacts associated with that um, fishing pier and the kayak launch, they received their tidal wetlands uh, permit on July 12th of 2021. Um, they have a slight modification under review. We are expecting that authorization to be done sometime this month. Um, so you'll see it's a conditional approval. That's part of our conditional approval for the project. Um, same thing, there are some non tidal wetlands impacts, and they are awaiting MTD approval. So once again, we have a conditional approval. That. And as this project is within the intensely developed area, it requires 10% stormwater management. It means that you need to reduce phosphorus by 10% more than what's existing on site today. In this case, they have to treat 9.16 pounds of phosphorus per year. They are providing above and beyond that using different stormwater management, best management practices, including non rooftop disconnects, two submerged gravel wetlands, and a perimeter sand filter. So they are meeting 10% on site with those. In terms of on-site mitigation, these areas that I believe are outlined in the purple and the orange, these are the areas where the plantings are going to be done. So we do have a mitigation plan in place that was reviewed by staff and determined to meet the requirements for mitigation on sites. 
Um, they're also providing off-site mitigation. Um, it's a location that is in the same watershed. It's a little bit further up the river, if I'm not mistaken. They're providing additional plants in this area on a county own park. Um, you can kind of see the area out on the right angle. So there is some off-site mitigation that's being provided, but it's once again in the same watershed to meet all their requirements. Uh, in terms of state agency reviews, Maryland Department of the Environment approved the sediment birth control plan in March 8th of this year. Um, and the EVA's approval, once again, because it is a voluntary cleanup site. Um, Storm management is pending approval by the county. And the issue of the Title Wetlands license in 2021, and the updates happening in 2023. Uh, DNR Wildlife and Heritage reviewed the site, and in a letter from May of this year, no records for rare threatened or endangered species. There's no concerns about the impacts to them. Um, Maryland Historic Trust reviewed it, determined there's no adverse effect on the historic properties. Public notice was published in the Daily Record of April of this year, and signs were posted on site as of April 18th, 2023. And I do not believe that there were any public comments that were received, at least as the right staff report, and I'm looking over and make sure there have been no public comments on the project. As I mentioned, this project is disturbing the buffer. A lot of that is associated with the grading due to the cap for ground fields cleanup. Therefore, it requires conditional permission. Those conditional, conditional approval standards are listed in your staff reports. And they are listed on up and find them. They're on page three of five. I have a feeling, given there's a lot of conditional approvals this morning, you probably heard a lot about conditional approvals and understand it. Um, so I would just go through these things very, very briefly. Um, County submitted information. Once again, qualify for the commission. They must demonstrate the pros are following features. Special site features um, on the site that literal enforcement of these regulations prevent the program from being implemented. Once again, this gets back to that voluntary cleanup program. They need to get into the buffer in order to disturb that to put the cap in. That is the reason we're here for conditional approval. Um, provides substantial public benefits for the critical area program. Again, we talked about the need of having public access to this community. This is a chance for the county to provide that. That's a good substantial benefit. As a commission, we want to provide public access to the water and to the water as part of our goals in our program. And that it otherwise is in conformance with the critical area law and regulations. They're meeting stormwater management, and they're providing the appropriate mitigation for the impacts they have to the buffer and outside of the buffer. Um, conditional approval has to contain one of the following demonstration that the literal enforcement of the subtitle would prevent an authorized standalone program or project from occurring. Um, they couldn't disturb the buffer, they couldn't provide the voluntary cleanup, they wouldn't be able to find this public access to the community. Um, how the project conforms with locally approved critical area program. Um, once again, they're complying with this conditional approval process. They're providing the required mitigation. And other than impacting the buffer, they're complying with the Baltimore County Critical Area Program um, in full. And then finally, measures to propose mitigation. Discuss those. We showed that slide earlier with all the mitigation for the offsets for the buffer. And again, I think you probably have seen this before, but basically, you're here today and to look for whether to approve, deny, or request modifications to the approval based on this criteria, that it complies with our conditional approval requirements and the regulations, that they provide adequate mitigation to address the requirements, and whether it provides substantial public, public benefits, which the county has addressed in the conditional requirements. Given all of that, staff recommends <coughs> the following conditions. Prior to the start of construction or 60 days, whichever comes first, County submits the final local stormwater management plan approved to critical area commission staff. And finally, prior to the start of construction of 60 days, whichever comes first, the county shall submit MDE authorization for impacts of both title weapons and non title weapons. With that, I hopefully didn't steer this car off the road. If anyone has any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Um, I guess I'll leave it over to oh, okay. Chair McCall. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, my question had to do with the it's statement in here says limited ability to use the entire site. Like, does what does that mean? Does that mean there are areas that are going to be fenced off that people can't actually go in? And I'm just thinking in terms of the people that are going to be visiting this park. Like, if you have kids, are they going to be trying to 
go into areas where they're like is is there a, a sufficient way of blocking off the areas that they're they shouldn't be on? Okay. You turn it over to yeah. So there will be signage up and then there's like large portions of site that's gonna be usable portion will be capped with two foot cap that has to go on the site. And then there will be signage along that cap. And it's well outside the usable area. So there's there's a vegetated buffer and then there will be signage. So it's not easily accessible. Can you briefly describe what the cap is that you reference? Because you paint the site up. What is that cap? What is the the parameters of the cap? Is it clay or what are you what are you doing to that? Usually it's a soil fill that's usually a certain distance above to kind of cap to keep the contaminants down, but they, they might have more technical. Yeah, they, they have it. yeah, it's a two foot soil cap. Um, and there is a uh, layer of like geotextile fabric underneath, so there'll be geotext we'll do rough grading that geotextile and a two foot cap on top of that. But does that stop the the contaminants from still getting in the groundwater? I mean how did that play out? It does. It's it stops contaminants from going both ways. So um, it, it's really water still infiltrates. That's still happening, but it's to stop any contamination from coming to the surface. If you've been, yeah, if you've been to the uh, Masonville Cove uh, recreational site, they had the same type of cap before they created sort of that, create that community area. So it's a very similar thing that I've seen. We, we had a project in Baltimore City that was a landfill. Now, now this. A rec center, like how it's almost like the same thing. I just yeah. always wondered what was the cap, how they stopping the, the pollutants from getting into the bay. I mean, I actually, yeah. other questions? Other questions? If not, um, can I get a motion uh, based on the staff report and the re conditional approval recommendation uh, for this project? Yeah, all right, thank you, Commissioner Palma. The second. Oh, I John. Thanks, Commissioner Eames. All right, and a vote on this project. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those um, opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. All right, Nick, I think. No, Charlie. Yes, Susan. <laughs> Susan number two. <laughs> So I guess this is an indication that it will be late. They're really behind over there. Okay. Once again, please bear with me. Uh, this is not my presentation, so I too will be as surprised by each slide as you are. Um, so before I start, we do have representatives here. Uh, Leanne Chandler from the Department of Natural Resources. Is there anyone else, Leanne? No, okay. just me. Just me. So hopefully you can help us yes. tag team questions. With Absolutely. Me. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting to you the uh, Department of Natural Resources and Department of General Services project at the Turkey Field Lighthouse. Um, these are improvements to the road, the parking lot, and also some ADA accessibility. And help next state park, sorry. Um, so real quick, I'm gonna run through just an overview of the project, the impacts and uh, mitigation, state agency reviews, the climate resiliency, public notice, more conditional approval for you all, um, and then I'll take questions at the end. So um, this project, basically, uh, it is coming to you all for two reasons. One, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Natural Resources. However, the impacts to this project exceed what's allowed under the MOU. Um, the project also has impacts to the buffer, so uh, it is requiring conditional approval for that reason. Um, so the project, uh, like I said, is located at Elk Neck State Park. I don't know if anyone's familiar familiar with the park, but it is located in Cecil County. It is on a peninsula, as you can see. The lighthouse is uh, right down here at the very tip of the peninsula. So current conditions, the um, if you visited, you know that you uh, kind of drive down the peninsula, you park at uh, the top of a trailhead, um, and, and then walk down to the lighthouse. Uh, the, um, 
there's not a whole lot of ADA accessibility for access to the lighthouse. Uh, the existing parking, these are images of that. Then there's the uh, long trail that you walk down. Um, these are some images of the severely eroding cliff. Um, Outback Peninsula is, uh, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can tell. See, that's the lighthouse, that little white dot there. This is all just like steep cliff. I think it's like 100 feet high. It's 50 to 100 feet in elevation. Um, and so a lot of those um, cliffs are eroding. And uh, particularly the cliff adjacent to the existing uh, road that goes down to Turkey Point. So the purpose of this project is to move that road away from the eroding cliff. One of the purposes of the project, I should say. Okay, so yes, here is the existing parking. Um, they are proposing to, and it kind of, well, it's hard to see this image, but it runs down like that. This is kind of the trail. You park up here, you come down this way. So what they want to do is move the, uh, this part of the path inland so that it is not right against the cliff. They are going to add a parking area down here so that the, um, distance that's needed to, to walk is less. And then they're also proposing ADA parking right at the lighthouse. Uh, so this maybe gives you a little better idea. Yeah, so the yellow is existing. So it runs, there's the parking, and then this, I guess that's existing in the buffer that's going to be removed. And is this the, the path right there? Does it go yes. Down? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so that's the existing path. Right along, these are all steep slopes here. You can see it's not super safe. Um, so the plan is to bring it out here so that it kind of comes down here. And then this is the proposed parking that's about <coughs> midway along the, um, the path. And then I think this connects up here, so if you're <laughs> pretending, uh, it'll keep coming down to here is where the um, lighthouse and the paper will be. Um, okay, so, uh, not sure. well, Rose Harbor is the location for an off-site portion of the mitigation, which I will get into later. Um, some of the stormwater uh, mitigation is being met off-site. Okay, so here's a summary of the impacts. Um, there are all kinds of uh, ratios associated with the buffer disturbance because of um, the various impacts associated with the project. So we are requiring three to one for buffer disturbance for any of the new development, the portion of the um, new uh, road that goes down to the new parking area, so that that is in the buffer, kind of up towards the top. Um, redevelopment, we're asking for one to one uh, for impacts to the buffer. There is construction access at the beginning of the uh, road um, that we are asking for two to one for mitigation for that. And then um, the canopy removed in total is uh, one to one for the so some of this uh, mitigation, which I think all of those ratios together total this almost 120,000 square feet of buffer mitigation. However, they are removing a significant amount of impervious within the buffer because they're abandoning that portion of the road that's running along the steep cliff. So they're removing that and it will be replanted. Um, so because of that, they get credit uh, for doing that. So that actually, um, Gives them a credit of about 70,000 square feet towards that mitigation. Um, there is also forest clearing outside of the buffer, which is mitigated based on the square footage of that canopy removed. Um, and I think most of that is probably for the parking area and the new roadway that it, kind it of comes like the from road. Yeah, it comes to the parking area. Um, so we got total. Um, 
buffer and floor clearing impact mitigation of almost 250,000 square feet. There is also a 10% pollutant reduction requirement of uh, 0.83 pounds of phosphorus per year. So, as I said, um, this uh, existing path, all of that, all that impervious will be removed and replanted. Um, there will also be plantings all along the new roadway. Um, and is this just a zoomed in version of the path? In the that's actually um, at Rhodes Harbor. Okay, um, okay, so this is where we get yeah. to the office. It's so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so 10%, um, there is going to be a uh, bioretention facility, I believe it's near the new park area, yeah. correct? Okay. okay. So on site, part of the stormwater management requirement will be met with this bioretention uh, adjacent to the new park area. Um, However, that's not going to be all of the 10% pollutant reduction requirements. So they are also installing a bioretention um, in another portion of the Elk Neck Park. So it's in the same park, so uh, section called Rose Harbor. There's an existing parking area there that has absolutely no stormwater management associated with it. So they are adding um, a bioretention there to treat that parking area. So that will combine to get them to the total 10% requirement. Uh, state agency reviews, so um, they have stormwater management and erosion sediment control approval from MDE. There are no impacts to tidal, non tidal, or non tidal wetlands. Uh, DNR, <coughs> you note that there is FIDS habitat on the site, um, and our science advisor has uh, reviewed uh, the proposed impacts and the proposed mitigation. Um, they are meeting our FIDS guidelines uh, from our uh, guidance document um, by if they're keeping the proposed road narrow enough to maintain canopy coverage. They're also um, augmenting um, the fit's habitat with the plantings they're proposing for mitigation. Uh, also, MHT uh, reviewed the project and determined um, there were no adverse effect. There was no adverse effect on uh, store practice. Okay, climate resiliency. If you've been to Turkey Point or Elbeck, it's kind of silly because, like I said, there's a, it's 100 feet above, uh, um, 100 feet above sea level, basically. Um, so there are no impacts from uh, sea level rise or storm, storm surge, and I believe um, the Coast Guard criteria did not apply to this project either. So there was um, no need to address those. Okay, public notice. So public notice was posted on site. Um, there was also a public hearing, and I believe there were comments received. And Leanne, do you want to go into a little bit more detail about that? It was mostly related to just parking and bike accessibility, I think, too. Yeah, we, we actually chose to hold a public meeting just for public relations perspective to inform the neighbors that this was happening, because if you've ever been to Elk Neck, you go through Elk Neck on 272, then there's a, like a, a almost an enclave of a private community, and then another piece of Elk Neck State Park. So that community in particular is heavily impacted by the existing parking problems at, at Turkey Point. So we held a public meeting as a courtesy to all those folks. Um, we had about eight people show up. Um, some were from the Turkey Point Lighthouse Society. Um, they're very supportive of the project. The neighbors were very supportive, though they were obviously concerned with the impacts during construction. Um, but I think we allayed their fears uh, as far as how we were going to perform the construction and what time of time frame we're dealing with. So um, overall, it was very positive. There was one person who actually wrote to me um, opposed to the project because they like they like the quiet um, during most of the year and the trail along the water, but. Um, for safety's sake, we really need to move the road. Thank you. Okay, so conditional approval plot process. This will be your third time going through this today, so hopefully this is old hat for you because it's going to be brand new for me. Okay. Um, 
So, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, this project requires traditional control because of the buffer of the services associated with it. If you look at pages five through seven of the staff report, um, you'll see where Susan has addressed each of the criteria related to conditional approval. Um, I will briefly walk through those with you now. Um, so, uh, the first criteria is that due to special features or circumstances um, at the site, uh, there uh, it can be um, following state or local agency uh, critical area regulations. Uh, it's very difficult to enforce them in the uh, site itself. So, um, like I said, the existing uh, road path is in the buffer currently. Um, it is the Further inland, there will still be a further pass associated with it. However, um, the project really couldn't be done without impacting the buffer just because of where that existing path is currently located. Um, so, does the proposal otherwise provide significant public benefit to the critical area program? Um, this is a heavily used farm. <coughs> uh, there are There is a lot of public use of it, particularly during the nicer um, weather months. Um, and again, for safety reasons, they need to move the path away from the cliff. Um, and the parking area that's proposed, um, kind of midway down the path, will provide better accessibility for visitors. I think it provides a lot more parking too. Yes. Um, I know when I went to visit Elkbeck Park, um, it was like someone was directing traffic in and out of the existing parking lot and there were like you had to wait until a space opened up and then you could pull in so like traffic back way up outside of the um, entrance so hopefully this will um, alleviate some of that and then the um, ADA accessible parking at the, at the lake house itself obviously will provide public benefit there um, and the proposals otherwise in conformance with Area law and regulations. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it is impacting this habitat. However, our science advisor has reviewed it and determined that they are meeting our guidelines, so they are following um, the criteria of all the regulations there. Okay, so um, does the project demonstrate enforcement of the area regulations would prevent a higher IC for long program or project from so I think it clearly does demonstrate that with the um, regulations for the disturbance to the buffer. Um, this project inherently needs to disturb the buffer. Uh, therefore, the project can be done that time if it was um, not strictly adhering to the regulations. Um, the means by which the project conforms with COMAR 270205, which is, regulates uh, state development on state lands, uh, as I've said, the project meets all of the requirements other than the impacts. And uh, measures are proposed to mitigate adverse effects of the project. So as I discussed previously, those buffer impacts are all going to be mitigated. Um, all of the planting, it's all being done on site for the buffer impacts. Um, and it is also creating and um, augmenting its habitat on site. So uh, we're getting a decent amount of habitat water quality. So, um, things that you all should consider um, when deciding whether or not to approve the conditional approval. Um, the extent to which the proposal complies with the relevant chapters of the subtitle. Again, the only reason it's here is due to the buffer disturbance. Um, it's the only uh, uh, conditional approval required. Um, the adequacy of the proposed required mitigation measures to address the requirements of the site title um, that cannot be met by the project. So, that's saying, um, are the, is the mitigation proposed enough to compensate for the fact that uh, there is disturbance to the buffer? So, as I said, in this case, there were multiple calculations, uh, ratio, buffer mitigation ratios, <coughs> the total disturbance, um, 3 to 1, 2 to 1, 1 to 1. <laughs> so, um, we kind of uh, analyzed what the impacts were for and how much mitigation we thought was needed because of that. So new development in the buffer, we asked for three to one construction access, we asked for two to one, and then one to one was for the can be removed. So uh, the extent to which the proposal 
mitigation measures provide substantial public benefits to the overall regulatory program. And as we discussed, the public state park provides a lot of public benefits. Um, Mitigation measures are also important. So we recommend approval of the project based on uh, the staff report and the conditional approval. All right, any questions on this project? I had one, Leah. Yeah. Um, and my computer died, so I don't know where in the document it was. Was there any natural regeneration associated with some of the removal of the roadway or the path? We are planning on doing some soil conditioning there okay. and replanting, but hopefully natural regeneration will also augment, um, you know, what, what we plant. Um, it's so compacted after yeah. decades of use, so there, it's actually the most um, comprehensive soil conditioning proposal I've seen. So I'm hopeful that it will it will survive long term and, and promote natural region. Um, and the the Rogues Harbor um, kind of offsite stormwater was really um, in an attempt to reduce our impacts on site originally. Our engineering folks had this giant, you know, 60-foot swath going through the forest, and we've narrowed it significantly by moving some of that stormwater offsite. Um, so, all right, thank you. That was my question. Yeah. I just was concerned about the compaction. I yeah. don't remember seeing that. Yeah. So, any other questions? All right. Um, I'm looking for a motion uh, based on the staff report and the recommendations for this conditional approval um, of this project. Motion to approve based on staff report and conditions. All right, thanks, Commissioner Grant. A second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Glantz, thank you. Um, all of those um, in favor of the project? Aye. 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 Um, <coughs> any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Passes. And that is the end of the project subcommittee meeting. Thank you so much. Good one. Lots of conditional approvals. <laughs> thank you.